uh, we live in the beginning of a major structural crisis of global capitalism. So the question we have is whether this structural crisis could be resolved within the basic framework of capitalism or instead like the case of the previous structural crisis like in the mid 20th century or in the 1970s, 1980s, it could again be resolved through restructuring of global capitalism. <coughs> and then if we think about the basic feature of the crisis, and first of all, it has to do with the contradiction of neoliberalism. And then secondly, it has to do with the decline of the American hegemonic power. Then thirdly, it has to do with the rise of new working class that demand political and economic rights that uh, historically uh, were denied to this working class. And then fourthly, it has to do with uh, the uh, deepening of the global ecological crisis and basically in various aspects, the global ecological system uh, on the verge of collapse. Okay, so if you look at this graph, uh, it looks a little bit messy because we have this GDP, you know about this GDP gross domestic product. And uh, uh, for Britain, US, and China, and their share of the total global economic output uh, for historical period from 1820 until uh, 2013, right? But we have these two different sources. And one is based on medicine study of world historical statistics. The other is based on the more current data from World Bank, and they do not necessarily, uh, they are not necessarily compatible with, with each other. And so it, uh, but ignore this messiness, and uh, if we just look at this red line in the middle, and which shows China's historical share of the global income output. So back to the time of the early 19th century, and China it was still the world's largest economy, accounting for about one third of the total global income output. Oh, wow. And, uh, but uh, over the course of the 19th century, if we know a little bit about the modern Chinese history, right, China was incorporated into the capital world system after the Opium War. And then from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century, and China suffered a sustained long term decline in terms of its relative position uh, in the capitalist world system, so that by the mid 20th century, China was reduced to one of the poorest countries, one of the poorest peripheral countries in the capitalist world system. And then in the meantime, the US, of course, had become the hegemonic power of the capitalist world system. And then from the 1950s to the 1970s, it was, uh, in the Chinese case, it was the period of Maoist socialism. And so under the socialist industrialization, it managed to stabilize China's position in the capitalist world system for the first time in modern Chinese history. And that was, of course, followed by the dramatic economic takeoff uh, that started in the 1980s. And if you look at that, the solid red line, if you look at the medicines data, and uh, so by that measure, China was already about 17% of the world GDP uh, by the year 2000. Uh, but based on the latest measure of World Bank, that is if you see those small little red dots uh, on the very right end, and uh, so that is the World Bank data. Based on World Bank data, uh, last year, China was about 16% of the world GDP. But in the meantime, the U.S. share declined uh, from more than 20% up to the late 1990s. Uh, it was still more than 20%, but now, uh, by 2013, uh, it, uh, it fell to uh, about 17% of world GDP. And so based on reasonable expectation of the difference in growth rates between the two countries, China is expected to overtake the U.S. Uh, so statistically speaking, uh, China is going to rank as the world's uh, largest economy based on the so-called purchasing power parity. Okay, so the question is, uh, observing this kind of dramatic transformation, right? and if you consider the history, and in the 19th century, China's historical decline coincided with the time when uh, Western capitalism expanded to include the entire globe and then became the globally, uh, dominant, uh, globally dominant economic system. And then in the 21st century, and the, how would this so-called rise of China uh, have impact on the operation of the global capitalist system? Okay. Uh, related to that, uh, for those who have read Giovanni Arighi, you may have heard about this concept of the so-called systemic 
cycles of accumulation. And uh, so that was uh, based on the successive uh, hegemonic power cycles. Uh, and so in the world system uh, tradition, uh, the capitalist world system was supposed to be based on the political arrangement of interstate competition. And so that arrangement was necessary because this kind of interstate competition created a relatively favorable, favorable balance of power between the state and the capital. And so that is favorable from the capitalist point of view. But the trouble with this interstate competition is that there's not a clear player that can take care of the structural interest of the system as a whole. So historically, the kind of solution that was, pro was provided was that uh, there had been successive hegemonic powers. That was one of the nation states, but in the meantime, they were sufficiently powerful, they, therefore they could regulate the systemic interests. And uh, in the long 20th century, uh, Arrighi observed the historical pattern uh, of this kind of hegemon cycle, therefore he raised the question about, historically we started with the Dutch hegemonic power. Uh, before that there was another uh, uh, Genoese uh, Iberian uh, system cycle, but that was considered not to be a hegemonic power. And uh, so we have Dutch hegemonic power, the British hegemonic power, the US hegemonic power. Right? And uh, so through these successive hegemonic powers, the territorial side, the state capacity, the military power of the next hegemonic power has been, uh, in the two cases, has been dramatically larger than the previous hegemonic power. So that was the case in the transition from the Dutch to the British hegemonic power. Uh, again, in the case of uh, British to the US hegemonic power. And by the time of US hegemonic power, the US was a, a continental-sized uh, nation state. Uh, the question is, with now the decline of the American hegemonic power, uh, it's not obvious there will be another state that is dramatically larger or more powerful than the United States, and therefore it's not obvious there will be another power that is in a position to replace the U.S. to function as the effective hegemonic power. So that may deprive the capitalist world system, one of its necessary conditions for it to operate and exist. So related to this, the question we have is, and of course if we observe the historical evolution of global capitalism, and in previous cases of structural crisis, global capitalism has managed to restructure itself and to deal with the contradictions within the basic framework of capitalism. But the question is whether in this latest current structural crisis, is this crisis still possible uh, to be resolved within the basic framework uh, of capitalism. So we know about this uh, major crisis of capitalism in the first half of 20th century, and that in response to that, uh, there were Great Depression, World War I, World War II, and then of course towards the end of World War II, the US managed to consolidate uh, is hegemonic power. And then under the US leadership, there had been restructuring of global capitalism, and that made major concessions to the new social forces, and that challenged capitalism uh, in the early 20th century, in particular made concessions to the Western working classes, and it also made concessions to the national liberation movements, and as well as the socialist camp led by the Soviet Union. And these conditions, these restructurings, then created the political condition uh, for the made, uh, massive boom and expansion of global capitalist economy from the 1950s to the early 1970s. Okay, then we know that uh, by the late 1960s, uh, capitalism was in crisis again exactly, uh, or to a large extent, because of the success of global capitalist accumulation during the first one or two decades after World War II. In particular, the economic boom after the war created conditions that tended to strengthen the power of the working class, not only in the Western core capitalist countries, but also in the semi peripheral countries, in particular in uh, Latin America, Eastern Europe, uh, Soviet Union. And so by the 1960s, the stronger working class power started to challenge the capitalist world system, led to decline of profit rate uh, pretty much in all the major capitalist countries 
And then in addition, this was also a time when there was the first or the early sign of the beginning of the ecological limits to growth in the form of two major oil price shocks in the 1970s. And then that in turn led to create a condition for the major political instability. And for that, I will not uh, go into the details. So in response to this major crisis, uh, as we all very familiar with, the global capitalist class managed to have this counter offensive uh, in the form of new liberalism, which in effect was a program to dismantle the historically established social contract between the capitalist class on the one hand and then working class on the other hand <coughs> after the World War II. Uh, but for this new liberal offensive to be successful, uh, it required not only particular policies, but also it required a new set of conditions that could change the global balance of power to the favor of the capitalist class against the working class. And for that to happen, as far as the capital labor struggle is concerned, most importantly, it required a new supply of large cheap labor force. And that new supply of large cheap labor force was made available by China's counter revolution and then the following capitalist transition. Okay, so we have this new liberal restructuring, but uh, Despite the success of new liberal restructuring in reviving the profit rate as well as uh, restoring condition, uh, favorable conditions for global capital accumulation, and then by the early 2000s, uh, the new contradiction started to emerge, and I will not go into the details, but basically under new liberalism, it tended to depress the global de effective demand, it also tended to generate financial instability, and for a while, the U.S. debt finance consumption, to some extent, offset these kind of tendencies uh, that would contribute to the instability of global capitalism, but that could not be sustained forever. And so we have got this major crisis in 2008 to 2009. And as a result, if we look at the contribution of different uh, economies, uh, the world's major economies, to the global economic growth, and so basically, if you look at this graph and look at that dark curve, dark curve that's the U.S. contribution, and uh, the blue line, that's the European Union's contribution, right? So back to the beginning of the 2000s, and which is actually every over 10 years, so that's actual data for the 1990s, uh, the U.S. was still the leading force to sustain the global capitalist growth. And uh, but by after 2008, China has overtaken the U.S. And now about one third of the global income growth comes from China. So what is supporting China's economic growth? And the first of all is based on the intense exploitation of China's uh, uh, cheap labor force. And then secondly, it is based on the depletion of natural resources, the degradation of the environment, <coughs> and then especially the massive consumption of fossil fuels. In the Chinese case, it's about coal, right? And then secondly, it depends on the exports to the uh, Western capitalist markets. But as a result of the development of the new liberal contradiction, all three conditions uh, by now have been undermined, and some of them have been going into the opposite direction. I will just show a few more graphs. Okay, so this one is to compare the historical uh, U.S. and the Chinese profit rate, and as well as the projected profit rate, right? And so the blue curve, that's the U.S. profit rate. If you look at the U.S. income history, and each time when this profit rate approached or fell below 10%, the U.S. capitalism was in major crisis. So that was case in the 1930s, case in the 1970s again, and then uh, actually for the 2009 recession, it dipped below uh, to something like 12 percent, but it did not uh, fall below 10 percent. Okay, the, by comparison, China, you can tell, uh, it has very high profit rate compared to other capitalist countries, but it has been falling 
And then if we look at that based on the current trend, <laughs> and uh, by the time of uh, 2020 to 2030, it's going to fall to a level that historically was associated with major crisis of global capitalism. Okay, so here is another interesting graph we want to look at. And this is the one that compares the non-agricultural labor force, uh, the share of non-agricultural employment uh, in the total employment, and uh, for uh, China and uh, several other countries that has conditions might be comparable to China. Okay, to make the story short, basically if you look at the case of Brazil, South Korea, and Poland, and historically when their non-agricultural labor force rose to a level that is more than 70% of total employment. And uh, these countries all entered into a period of major working class militancy as well as political uh, instability. And if we look at China, China now is, uh, this share is rising rapidly and already about 66% and then continue to rise at the rate of about one percentage point a year. So again, look at this indicator, you might want to expect some kind of major political instability in China in the 2020s. So just to go over a little bit, uh, very briefly, about the uh, historical development of inter international working class. So uh, about half a century after the Communist Manifesto, by the late 19th century, uh, the working class movement had become quite strong throughout Western Europe and also to some extent in North America. And then in fact, uh, basically for all the continental uh, European working class parties for a while, Marxism became the official doctrine and they were organized into the second international. And then of course soon after the second international was established, a serious internal debate broke out between the revisionists who argued that uh, the primary task of the working class party was to work for social reform within the capital system and uh, on the one hand, and then the revolutionary Marxists, uh, the Leninists, uh, on the other hand. And so when the World War I broke out, uh, again, we are talking about 100th uh, anniversary of World War I. When the World War I broke out, uh, the Second International was uh, bankrupt, it integrated because the working class parties decided to support their own capitalist national governments instead of proletarian internationalism. So uh, reflecting upon this, and we know that Lenin uh, in 1916, he wrote uh, this pamphlet on imperialism, uh, reflecting upon this phenomena of revisionism. And so Lenin's uh, uh, analysis was that in the era of imperialism because of the capitalist exploitation of colonies, and then it was possible for the capitalist class in the imperialist countries to reap super profits from the colonies, and the super profits would uh, provide a material foundation for the Western capitalist class to uh, use some of the uh, super profits to buy off uh, a section of the working class in the form of labor aristocracy. And so for Lenin, that was considered to be the material foundation of revisionism. Okay, so how did history play out? Uh, in the short run, and so if we think about the time from 1914 to 1945, uh, maybe up to 1949, uh, it seems the Leninist analysis was to a large extent correct. Uh, the strategy uh, about turning the uh, imperialist war into the domestic class war, and uh, then to, to turn the imperialist war into opportunity for uh, socialist revolution seems to be uh, successful, at least in parts of the world. But after the World War II and uh, with the consolidation of U.S. hegemonic power and uh, there had been restructuring of the global capitalist system and there had been concession to the Western working classes as well as concession to the uh, national liberation movements in the non-Western world. And uh, so, it, so it appeared that uh, the global capitalist system had managed to solve the Leninist challenge and by redistributing the global surplus value. So why was that kind of redistribution possible? And first of all, if we talk about concession to the Western working class, right? And uh, 
So that was made possible on the one hand by the hierarchical structure of the capitalist world system. So let me talk about this imperialist super profits. But it turns out this kind of hierarchical structure uh, between the core periphery and the semi-periphery did not just exist in the late 19th century and early 20th century. In fact, you could argue it existed throughout the entire lifetime of the capitalist world system. And so with the concentration of the world surplus value uh, in the uh, hands of the Western core capitalist countries, it became possible for the core capitalist class to buy off not just the labor aristocracy, and uh, at least the, the majority of the Western working classes and could be to some extent accommodated within the global capitalist order. And then secondly, of course, the post-1950 uh, era was uh, remembered as the golden age, the unprecedented rapid growth of the global capitalist economy. That was made possible not only by the global capitalist restructuring, but materially it was made possible by the massive exploitation of the natural resources, the remaining part of the global ecological space, and especially uh, the abandoned and the cheap supply of oil. So these were the conditions that made possible for this global capitalist accommodation of the challenge of the working class. And then, of course, we know that by the 1960s, uh, the successful expansion of global capitalist economy had transformed the underlying economic and the material conditions so that by the 1960s, uh, the working classes had become so strong and so not only they demanded concessions from the capitalist class, moreover, the working class demand has become uh, so much increased and uh, that was sufficient to threaten the capitalist profit rate. And not only in the Western world, but also uh, in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, and uh, the, the previous regime of accumulation, no matter how you name that, was also threatened by the stronger working class that demand more uh, economic and political rights. And then in addition to that, uh, by the 1970s, the cheap oil era come to an end. And uh, first of all, because of the US oil production reaches first peak, and then the OPEC has got the pricing power in the world oil market. And that made possible for the uh, two major oil shocks in the 1970s. And so the combination of this led to this major uh, global capitalist instability. Okay, so uh, then in response to that, uh, this time instead of making concession to the wo working classes of the national liberation movements, the question had to do with how to restore the global profit rate. And the strategy for the global capitalist class was to uh, dismantle the previously established uh, social contract, not only nationally, but also globally. And, uh, and then we also talk about that China's cheap labor force played an important role in this. Now, China could not compete with the Western countries on technology frontier, and China could not compete with all exporters uh, based on the supply of natural resources. And so there was just one thing that China could really supply and also in abundant quantity, uh, that is the wage workers. Uh, at a very low wage rate, and then thanks to the Maoist era, well educated, and then with reasonably good uh, infrastructure uh, by the third world standard. Okay, but to achieve that, there was one major obstacle. That is, the the Chinese state sector workers were still protected by many socialist rights, and so from the 1980s to the 1990s, a central subject of the China's uh, China, the class struggle in China had to do with whether the socialist rights of state sector workers uh, could be preserved or not. And then in this struggle, uh, initially, uh, basically the, the entire urban petty bourgeoisie, or you might call it urban middle class, was behind the capitalist voters uh, who controlled the Communist Party. And so by the early 1990s, uh, basically it was possible uh, for the capitalist voters to, to lead this pro-capitalist alliance that included the Communist Party elites on the one hand, 
and then the urban middle class on the other hand, and then on the other hand, the, the state sector working class was isolated and also politically disoriented, and so they were defeated in this uh, privatization in the 1990s. And so uh, that created the condition, uh, and then of course there was the dismantling of people's commune, which made it possible for the rural surplus labor force to be exploited by the new capital enterprises, and then by the beginning of this century, and uh, uh, China had become the manufacturing export uh, center in the global capital system, and that in turn contributed to the global capital relocation in the new labor era, and uh, that uh, facilitated the recovery of the global profit rate. Right. So that was the story in the 1990s. Now, uh, up to that point, new liberalism has been very successful, but the very success of new liberalism, and as we uh, being Marxists are familiar, the very success of system would always generate its own contradictions. And uh, so uh, on the one hand, uh, because of this new liberal effort to uh, redistribute global income from labor to capital, from the poor country to rich countries, it tended to depress the global effective demand, it tended to increase the global uh, financial instability, and for a while the U.S. debt finance consumption had to offset that, but that could not be sustained forever. And then the success of the global new liberalism to the extent it was based on this expansion of the global cheap labor force, uh, which happened mostly in China. And uh, of course, with rising wage share, that means the capitalists are going to get a smaller share of the overall income output. And if that trend is uh, continued, and that will be very bad news for the Chinese capitalist class. Uh, but the question is, and we know that similar things happened to the European uh, working class in the 1960s, and in that case, the capitalist class organized a counter-offensive. Right? So the question we have is whether uh, there is something that the Chinese capitalist class could do to reverse this trend towards more favorable uh, conditions for the working class. <laughs>